Welcome to Veza Talks podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Gare Christian Carlson, who's the founder and CEO of Apps Company Incorporated, which is a member of World Economic Forum Tech for Integrity Initiative. Gare is a serial entrepreneur with more than 20 years of experience in the technology field, and he created several technology companies in Norway, USA, Slovakia, and Serbia. He also holds a number of board and advisory roles from Abu Dhabi to St. Louis and is a leader within blockchain security and digital privacy. Welcome. Thank you so much, Mario. Nice to meet you guys. Excellent. Well, uh, before we uh, dig uh, deep into uh, your current company, um, I read a little bit about you and I understand that you're passionate about hockey. So uh, I believe you're in Norway right now and uh, hockey is a big national sport over there. Tell us a little bit about hockey and uh, you know what uh, I understand you used to play and, and your experience with that because that's really uh, uh, where a lot of uh, people uh, uh, early on in their lives uh, form uh, certain qualities which then later translate into, uh, in, uh, into business uh, acumen. Sure, I mean, um, of course ice hockey I've been doing a lot uh, in, in my life. I also played in the top league of Norway uh also played in the US for uh for uh for the final year of high school uh as an exchange student and uh for a pleasure to be a state champ uh in in soccer there so I played both soccer and ice hockey but continue in ice hockey um and of course uh I think you can learn from any sports you know because it's uh, competitive and of course uh, if you are having a founding life it's also competitive so I, I think you can learn a lot from uh, from sports actually to uh, to to business side uh, right of things I'm curious where did you play I, I played soccer for football for 35 years myself in uh, Germany Canada and the US where did you play I played in Norway but I also played in the US so yeah we were uh, uh, I had some uh, offers there to go for a scholarship, but I never understood at that time what that uh, did mean because it's free schools in Norway and I guess a lot in, the, in right. Europe. But uh, yeah, it was a kind of funny thing. Uh, I should probably have went to college in the US, but uh, went back home and then uh, uh, entered more the ice hockey career than the soccer career. But yeah, uh, I, um, you know, you know, I mean, when you are an athlete, I think that the uh, same for you guys, right? You know, uh, you have multiple talents, right? You know, when you are having, a, you know, uh, doing one sport, I think that usually the guys who is uh, good in handball or ice hockey or soccer, they could maybe be even good at tennis or, you know, I mean, right. it, it's not uh, limited, I think. But of course, you have your specialty. Of course. And, you like. and my liking was ice hockey. I like that better than soccer but uh, I don't know in my older days I, I watch more soccer so <laughs> <laughs> and what, uh, what's your what's your favorite NHL team um, it were New York Rangers uh, of course I've been a lot in St. Louis so I need to I need to also uh, I watch sure. the Blues, uh, the Blues yeah. we, have, we have Sucarello that is now playing for the Minnesota Wild so That's of course right, yeah. I'm watching that a bit yeah yeah yeah, I actually lived in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, uh, during the 80s. And, you know, when uh, the Oilers were uh, on fire and uh, it was, <laughs> I didn't realize at the time how good they were because they just kept winning one Stanley Cup after another. And uh, now I'm just like, wow, I was part of history, you know, back then it was just normal, you know. But, uh, and then of, of course, uh, you know, Gretzky went to LA and then eventually St. Louis and all that, right? So, yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, I think definitely sports, uh, early on forms you in a way uh, where competition is really uh, stressed. I, I think competition is really good. I think uh, camaraderie with uh, other players is really good. And the best teams, as you know, have you know, unity in common, right? It's not a bunch of uh, players just doing their thing, right? So, uh, so that's, that's cool. So then after your hockey career, I guess, did you... Uh, did you transition straight into uh, entrepreneurship or did you actually work for several companies or how did that work? Uh, I worked actually as an uh, IT consultant uh, business, um, but during the ice hockey, I also turned into a little bit of the um, player unions. 
Okay. Uh, since I was got uh, injured when I was playing in the top league of Norway when I was 26, I just uh, uh, entered the player union of ice hockey. But ice hockey and then soccer or football for for us Europeans and mm-hmm. um, and handball work together in one union. So I entered actually the soccer slash football uh, players union and also the international union and. Um, also, we're there to create some uh, rights for FIFA player games and 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 all the the, the football games uh, in, the, in the world. So yeah, that was a fun period, and then I started my founding life actually after that. Okay, amazing. And then uh, so talk about a little bit that was uh, your current company, uh, the company you started, or were there several in between? Yeah, I started out basically to 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 um, uh, I started out as a, as a founder of a more like traditional you know web pages, web shops type of a a company, uh, and it was pretty successful. But during that, I actually looked into my father's computer. He was an HR director of a bigger meat slaughterhouse in Norway. And, and then he was doing a lot of change for workers. And I said, okay, we can automate that. You know, he was creating these different job centers around. Um, and I figured out we can automate that so you can be very efficient in how you control the people and helping them to get another job and, and, and these things. So that was actually the start of my HR company uh, called Evolution Software that I exited in 2015 went fully out in 2017 and then, I don't know, put all my energy um, into Absco. Uh, that is my venture okay. at the moment. Great. So Absco uh, is uh, a company you're currently running. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and uh, what it entails? Yeah, it's, uh, um, of course, uh, with the background of the HR and all the things with the on and offboarding and things like that, we created the identity and access management because I see that the on and offboarding needs to actually also control access rights to the different system, especially when you are in a hybrid environment. This is becoming quite problematic, as we all know, you know, with multiple logins. Uh, and of course, they, um, we created also then expandable with the core HR because we analyzed a lot what we were doing for all these companies. So now we are tying that in. And then when we tied that in, we said, okay, how can we protect that? And our thing where we can't because it's, it's a mathematical problem of probability. It's uh, every time you kind of prevent an hack, it's more likely to find somewhere you can be breached uh, you will have uh, some openings you know either employees or it will be some you know some ports or something that you left open so we said okay when it's like that you will be hacked and every company every person will be hacked because you always you, you are not secure in this right. in its world and I said okay what can you do then okay we need to store things data with you so we can at least minimize the risk for it and in the same time we could uh, then store data encrypted even though it's stored centralized so you're kind of decentralizing the access to the data to you and i'm very passionate about that because we just made a new new engine that that actually can do that both then tokenization encryption and and uh, decentralization and uh, and also incorporate your business rules because the first process will make your data secure and the next process will basically implement your business rules for example like storing the devices in blockchain utilizing right. technologies like that um, and i believe that's the future of we need new secure security solution uh, to protect data for right. you and your businesses. So I'm pretty passionate about that, right. uh, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, blockchain technology is, you know, very, uh, it's, it's an amazing tool, so to speak, right? I've always been talking about putting governments on blockchain, you know? And uh, my 
guess is that uh, income taxes would go below 3% if uh, we actually did that. <laughs> you know, uh, So uh, the majority of governments don't want that, I don't think. But, uh, well, maybe Norway does, <laughs> Sweden, you know, those countries. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I'm curious to hear about, uh, you know, how you actually utilize blockchain technology in, uh, you know, uh, the data that uh, you use and how, how do you prevent um, the breaches in systems, you know? So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. First of all, I mean, for, for us, blockchain is not the most important thing. Actually, tokenization is the most important thing. Tokenization means that we are exchanging, uh, you know, the sensitive data for a token. So you can store a token with random, actually, numbers and letters uh, in your system. It means that if a hacker hacks that, he gets nothing. Um, and then of course the encryption right so if he also hacks that data that you actually then can sync on the different nodes or servers or your your own devices for example you have a password that actually is with you right so the access to the system can be with you not actually at the centralized place but you are, are enabling you to log in as, as, as one example um, and you know, when you when you entering that person or that way of protecting your data, if you, I see now that Zero is uh, coming in here as well on my other iMac. So it's, <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> Governments are less listening in here. <laughs> uh, well, you can say that. Um, when you're doing that decentralization to the user, it gives you the power to, to, to have the control of the data. So when you are breach centralized, you actually get nothing. And the vulnerability then will be that you are hacked, right? So then it's a question, okay, how can um, you protect your device? And that's where I think the blockchain parts comes in. Okay. Um, it can, for example, uh, make sure that you can store then, you, you, let's say that you had a secure wallet with your password um, and then you want to access that, right? Because that's the vulnerability that you will be having here. Here is the decryption is happening um, and you're going to, for example, view your data or give that password so you can log in. And, and that's pretty interesting because then you can have your devices in the blockchain make sure that not your device is tampered with as one of the, what you can call business rules or voting process for you to be sure that this, this device is actually trusted. Um, then you can of course uh, add other, what you can say, security layers to it, like behavioral, how you tap swipes, uh, you know, hold your phones. Um, you can add biometrics, of course, you can even get geometrics like location Yep. So things like that is actually interesting, you know, and some part of that data should be stored, I think, in the blockchain to make sure that it's not tampered with. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the first thing that comes to my mind is Pegasus out of Israel, right? So, I mean, I have some knowledge, not <laughs> knowledge, not knowledge, but I have some understanding as to the power of Pegasus. I think it's 2.0 now or whatever it is. And the, the ability of this to just, you know, ransack your, your, your systems and get all the data, right? So um, the, the, the spin with blockchain is interesting to me because, uh, yeah, the privacy bit is, is quite uh, uh, important, right? So as a company, uh, can you speak a little bit about uh, the size of your company and what your uh, kind of uh, goals are for the next, uh, you know, 12 to 24 months? Yeah, we have been, uh, what you can say, quite huge goals. The size of the company today is about 40 employees. Uh, Norway and Belgrade is, is our kind of uh, biggest home uh, today. Um, of course, we see major, I would say, markets in Europe and US. Um, so the goal of the company now is, of course, to um, expand further in those markets. Uh, and um, as well as we, we have a joint venture also for the MENA region in, in, in Abu Dhabi, 
with uh, with Mr. Uh, uh, Ahmed Nasser Al Nawais. Mm -hmm. So of course I see also growth in that region. To be honest, yes. um, going forward, both from an HR perspective but also security perspective. Uh, of course, security is um, is pretty big now in I, I would say uh, Europe and and US and. Uh, Kind of like the whole society is under attack. So I, I really believe that that needs uh, to be protected somehow. And um, uh, yeah, the goals is actually to work with businesses, I would say, at the first stage. But of course, the technology can also be used to launch uh, B2C concepts. Um, right. I'm not sure that AppSco will do that, but we will enable it to that other people can build on top of our engine that we created here. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, the, the Middle East is uh, really taking off in every aspect. Uh, you know, I mean, crypto friendly, uh, business friendly, uh, low tax jurisdictions. I mean, we're, we're actually opening an office in, uh, in Dubai in Q1 of next year, expanding from our three offices. Uh, so it's it's really great to see the initiatives there. It seems like a lot of countries are going backwards, trying to hold on to the old paradigms. But uh, you know the the money will flow into the areas or countries that are uh, open to you know the next revolution, so to speak. Right. So uh, interesting. Uh, I'm also interested about uh, Serbia, Belgrade. You so you have office an office here, which. Uh, Right now, uh, we do as well. So what made you actually uh, decide to uh, pick uh, Serbia as one of your offices? Well, I don't know if you heard the long story or the short story, but let's try to make it short. <laughs> which, one is, which one is the more fun story? <laughs> it's a kind of funny story. Uh, but um, what you can say, long story short, is that we had... Uh, we had some uh, offices in actually in Bratislava, Slovakia, okay. uh, which I saw that we we weren't so successful in. I, I would think, and I, I'm blaming that on on me, you know, because outsourcing is not so easy, uh, sure. to be honest with you. And uh, learn a couple of things, but I met a met a guy there actually in a bar, uh, through some friends of mine. So we agreed that uh, I guess after a. a, a a pretty interesting night that uh, I will go to Belgrade and check this out, you know, and do something different. And, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of what you can know, almost say prejudice, in, you know, uh, against that, you know, like saying, okay, yeah, Serbia and this and that, you know, what, what is that? And then what I learned is that it's, um, it's a very interesting people, a very interesting um, country. Um, and also I learned that Norway, Norway has very good relationship with the, Norwegian Serbian friendships. So I would say to be open sometimes, you know, uh, not to judge uh, creates you into some path that actually you, you realize that it's uh, uh, it's not completely what the media what it would 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 say. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It gets you perspectives and I'm very happy about actually being in Belgrade, to be honest. Amazing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, uh, started coming here 2015, 16, 17. And uh, uh, the more I came here, the more I liked it. And uh, I mean, the IT industry is huge here. You know, the, the advantage of Serbia is obviously that the majority of people speak English, especially the younger generation. And it's, you know, it's, it's quite good. And uh, that, uh, you know, obviously uh, labor costs are much lower uh, for now. I mean, it is going up quite a bit. But uh, definitely, uh, a lot of companies are uh, moving here, which is uh, interesting. You know, you would nobody would have uh, bet on Serbia ten years ago. But uh, yeah, so that's really interesting. So that's uh, what I did, though. I, I bet it twelve years ago. So yeah. Wow, that, that's <laughs> that was pretty early, I think. That, yeah. That's really early. Yeah, absolutely. That, I've, I've never met anybody that's not a that <laughs> early adopter, I guess. Right. So yeah. so that's really good. Cool. Um, so uh, in t uh, what else? Um, uh, would you like to share in terms of your company that our viewers, uh, you know, would love to hear? Is there any uh, information about your company that's, uh, you know, uh, revolutionary, so to speak? Is that something up in the pipeline that you guys think that is going to change, uh, you know, the way uh, 
uh, data is being shared. Uh, talk a little bit about that. I think a little bit what I touched, you know, because the, um, it's it's a lot of companies that is doing, you know, what we're doing now in the data protection field, you know, with the tokenization, some is doing encryption, some is doing decentralization. And of course, some is doing some kind of voting and business rules processes, uh, but n none of them are actually doing it in combination. And that was actually our passion and, 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 and also uh, in the US. So I met a lot of companies, also big global Fortune 500 companies, and they haven't heard about that solution, to be honest with you. So I would actually love even the viewers to say, okay, if it's anything, I would actually like to know about it. Um, and one thing is, of course, to protect, but I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate, I think about, you know, you touched also with this one. I, I don't think that our, I think that our actually what, what you can say, so-called democracy, uh, um, rely on that. Not everybody is tapping into your data, right? You know, and we learn for, you know, f I saw an interview with Elon Musk also on Fox News saying, okay, governments also has direct access to your direct messages. And I understand it to one certain point, you know, that, you know, it's all about protection, right, of people usually. But I think we need to consider also, do you need to surveillance everybody to protect for from what, you know? Because I, I think it's a fine line here. Uh, to be honest with you, outside of what you can say, the pure things that you want to achieve as a company, you know? Yep. But I really think it's a very, very important subject to discuss more about how we should do that, even how we should do voting processes in the future. Why could we do it something similar like that? And you put it on the blockchain. Absolutely. You know, and you don't you don't need to know what people vote. You can just do a token and then you say one or two or three or four or five. But yep. at least it's public and you can check it. So right. if everybody wonder is the election tampered with, okay, go to the blockchain. Ask it. Right. You check check what you you your at least yourself voted. So I think we need to address that topic, you know. And I'm pretty passionate if, if somebody would um, build something like that based on our technology. We will not build it, but we can enable it through the engine. We want it to be implemented everywhere uh, into software and solutions. So we can enable things like that. And I, I hope that we can, in the future, as you know where I'm headed, you know, to, to do really discuss that and that people need to be more in power of their data. Absolutely. I agree with you. I think, uh, again, goes back to my initial point about uh, governments not wanting to put the election process on the blockchain for obvious reasons. I think that uh, that's, a, that's a huge issue. I think any government that is uh, not open to that is, uh, you know, there's, they're suspect. Um, you know, and also I think with data protection and uh, free speech, I'm a big proponent of free speech. I think that uh, all communication should be private uh, unless you choose not for it not to be. So, um, you know, that's, it's, I, I think that that fine line has really been crossed way, 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 way too far already. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like in five years. Um, interesting question. I saw in your uh, bio that you're also a member of the WEF. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? Uh, I don't really... Uh, know anybody that that's, that has been a member of the WF? So, what, 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 why did you become a member, and how does it serve you? I mean, I, uh, yeah, member, not member. I mean, we we, we had. I was a member of. Uh, it was a, a city bank uh, type of a, a, a project, and then you know it was a tech for integrity project, and then I ended up a little bit like being invited because it was taken over by World Economic Forum. Yep. And you can say, okay, then I was invited to something. I didn't go there. Um, and I wrote some articles uh, on the World Economic Forum and warning about grid hacking and, and things like that. Um, so 
I wouldn't say that I would have been heavily involved in that. I know it's also controversy, to be honest with you, uh, yeah. because uh, of course you you should be scared of something that they are saying, you know. Yep. Uh, at the other things, you know, so I, I think it's all always what you can say, white zones, gray zones, and uh, and more black zones, right? You know, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, something between, but. I think to influence that, because of course I am big believer on free speech uh, and democracy and data uh, that need to be protected for every human one at a time. Absolutely. Uh, to be honest, and so I, I would urge even them to maybe consider some of their, at least what I've seen in the news of the articles, you know, I would urge them to look into that because not everybody should kind of like be rented and you should own almost anything and you still be happy. You know, I, I'm not sure that uh, I believe in centralization at all. I think that the, the prosperous societies, if we are going to go into some good age going forward needs to be decentralized. Absolutely. I think we need to have more communities, local communities, support those local communities, support those local businesses. Right. So um, even though I'm going kind of global myself, right? Because we are all ending up in that kind of, you know, run because we all need, you know, the kind of the financial system to work. But in the same time, maybe think about how we should go forward as well. And blockchain technology is kind of interesting play there, to be honest. Um, and I agree with you there as well that I think it's problematic that everybody who I love US, for example, but I hate what they're doing to crypto Yep. Uh, because I don't think that it's actually even smart for them, you know, I, you know, nope. they're seeing it as attack, I think, of the US dollar, who is a different subject. But for me, I, I see it's actually stupid. I, I would say that make the US dollar the one that you're exchanging to in the crypto market, and they're stopping the evolution because they don't see that blockchain technologies is actually good for a lot of things, you know, absolutely. You know, and it doesn't need to be Bitcoin or crypto. It's like the technology itself, what it can do, right? Because it's actually making um, the cost of verification go down. And Absolutely. do you need to verify things? Yeah. In the whole financial world, you need to verify things. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a matter of uh, people that are in the positions not really knowing what they're doing. I mean, I watched... Uh, 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 an in, wasn't even an interview, it was a congressional hearing, I believe, uh, of the man in charge of uh, regulating crypto who has never, ever had a wallet and never used crypto himself, is <laughs> in charge of, of the crypto regulations. And you can't make this up. I mean, it's absolutely, cr it's craziness. You know, you, you saw the congressional inquiry with uh, the TikTok uh, 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 CEO and the questions that were posed to this guy were... They, they they were so rudim they weren't even rudimentary they just they just don't know anything about it it's almost like you know they're still living with the horse and buggy a uh, uh, hundred years ago it's absolutely it's almost embarrassing you know on the on the positive side you know crypto and blockchain will flow into countries that are open as I said I think those are the new frontiers I think that they are going to uh, flourish, you know, and uh, and you're right. Uh, the U.S. dollar is losing its dominance. There's no two ways about it, and uh, uh, they better wake up to the fact that otherwise it's gonna go real quick. Um, all empires uh, at some point uh, do cease to exist. It's just a matter of you know time, I suppose, right? So that's interesting. You know, I mean, uh, I looked at you know the the WEF and the CB, uh, CBDCs that they're trying to create, which I think. Uh, is it's really important that people understand that the, the governments are creating uh, current digital currencies that are centralized, that they're not decentralized. So there's a huge difference between what they're trying to create and, and crypto. And that's really important that people um, educate themselves on that because uh, otherwise we'll get into this uh, whole social uh, 
uh, system where you get to uh, you get uh, social scores and things like this, which you know uh, obviously is completely opposite of uh, individual freedoms and free speech and whatnot. You know, but yeah, very interesting topic. Um, so in conclusion, I ask every one of my guests the following question, and that is, uh, if you were in my shoes and you would ask yourself a question that I didn't ask, what would that be? Wow, that's a that's a that's a <laughs> that's a good one. I, I think we touched a lot of topics. Um, uh, I would maybe sometimes uh, I would rather than say uh, not maybe even a question, but a, a comment that I hope that we all can think of. Uh, that um, you know, like if you are going to a little bit deeper, like okay, I say that. You keep, you're coming naked into this life and you're going naked out. Yeah. So, tr yeah. you know, what I learned during my life and when I get grayer here that uh, I think it's more about what you do during this life uh, and what experiences are you going to do that, you know? So, because we all act from our personal things, you know, right? You do it, I do it. And... Um, it's good to reflect over that. What are you doing and, 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 and see your kind of situation? Because we are all kind of here for very limited time. Yep. Uh, and that goes for the governments. And that goes for you as an employee, you as a father, you know, everything. So I think just maybe to, to think over that would be and reflect over that can maybe uh, at least give you some thoughts that you don't know everything, you're not good at any, any, uh, everything, you're good at something, everybody are, cherish that. And uh, when you are thinking and reflecting over these things, uh, I think it can give you, give you kind of some, some, some answers and um, Maybe also understanding of, of other people's maybe reactions. And um, that comes from a person that I, I experienced both very much good in my life. And, and I must say that uh, I was backstabbed also very, very many times during a business life. It's a, it's a tough thing, you know, and it's not also um, when you're a founder, it's also a lonely, uh, lonely road. Yeah. Right? So, so it was a, a little bit, maybe not an, a, a question, but maybe something to reflect over. And, uh, and also that founding why life is, uh, is not so easy, you know, um, create at least some things that it's a need, you know, figure it out if it's a need and somebody wants to pay for it, Absolutely. because if not, it's going to be hurting you big time and yeah make sure you work with clients. You can never be too early, you know, uh, in, in a market and figure out that the market needs what you're developing. And it's always a challenge. Well, that's great. Really great words of wisdom. Um, I think as, as one gets older, uh, a lot of things that we used to think are important fall off and uh, we try to recalibrate the important things in life. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a really great interview. Uh, Thank you. Hopefully, we'll have a, you know a, a beer in in Serbia together when you when you do come here, and uh, and uh, hope to see you soon. Sure, I'm done for that. So thanks a lot. Great. Thank you.